Uh, well, the latest arrival was uh, Jeff Bezos and his £48 million uh, <laughs> Gulfstream jet, private jet, arriving at uh, the Festival of Hypocrisy that is COP26. Uh, can we just have a little listen to some of the leading players uh, in this farcical event that borders on comedy? It is so hypocritical. Let's have a listen. Well, this is very, very urgent for not just for our country, for the whole world. And if I had to give a comparison, I'd say it was a, it was a one minute to midnight moment and the, uh, the clock is, is, is ticking. We have to get uh, everybody to do more and they need to make further commitments. They need to make further commitments on how we're going to move away from coal, from fossil fuel burning. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown us just how devastating a global cross-border threat can be. Climate change and biodiversity loss are no different. In fact, they pose an even greater existential threat to the extent that we have to put ourselves on what might be called a warlike footing. Well, uh, that's just a, a few excerpts uh, from the verbiage uh, being spewed up there in <laughs> Glasgow. Uh, Joe Biden's on his feet making a speech now. I wouldn't want to inflict that on you, David. Uh, but uh, the <laughs> levels of hypocrisy are just astounding, aren't they? Joe Biden up there telling us about saving the planet, not emitting carbon. Uh, he took 85 cars with him to Glasgow and is rushing around the city in a 20-car cavalcade. It's just obscene, isn't it? It is obscene. I mean, nice speeches, good set pieces, highly choreographed, these two announcements on deforestation and then, of course, reduction of methane. But the frank hypocrisy, as you say, Boris Johnson, if you remember, set out and said, we are surrounding the planet in a cloud of carbon dioxide. And the frank hypocrisy that they fly in in 200 to 400 private jets seems to be lost on them. Even my arch nemesis, Ursula von der Leyen, came in from Europe on a plane. Why can't she get Eurostar like we used to do when I was in the European Parliament? I think people are sick and tired of being told what to do. I think the melodrama behind this, we've had a crazy two years, a horrible two years, and suddenly it's now our fault once again for something else. Boris Johnson talking about one minute to stop the detonation of the time bomb. And whilst most of us or the vast majority want to do something about climate change, the big question and the elephant in the room is who's going to pay for it? Yes, uh, I'm gathering that one estimate is uh, that uh, to reach carbon net zero by 2050 will cost Britain uh, $1,000 trillion. Uh, and that means that will cost you and me uh, and the taxpayer all that money. And uh, one thing I was talking about last night, but I'd like to get your view on it. I mean, what we've got here is a bunch of ephemeral world leaders, people who are running their countries right now, making pledges about 2030. They're unlikely to be around then, at least as world leaders. Uh, but also 2050 for carbon net zero, if you're in Britain. 2060, if you're in Saudi Arabia. 2070, if you're in India. Uh, in other words, these are pledges uh, that none of these leaders will personally be able to guarantee, basically because they'll all be dead and their successors will ignore the empty promises of the past. We are getting nothing but hot air. None of this stuff is going to happen. I mean, it, it would be laughable if it wasn't so serious. Absolutely right. The fact is that actually the UK has done an enormous amount to decarbonise. We, we are well ahead of many of our competitive countries. And the fact is that actually we do need to do more without a doubt. But as I keep saying, who is going to pay the price of this? How ma many of these commitments are actually binding? We don't know. And if you remember going back, it was Theresa May in 2019 who committed us to this net zero target, but without actually consulting anyone and then Boris Johnson went one step further trying to be this great big statesman by including international air travel on it and the fact is the British people have never been asked what they want and I think it's about time we had a referendum on net zero and whether we actually want to pay for it and the question is how are we going to do it and going forward we're already seeing skyrocketing energy prices we're seeing energy companies folding I think in the new year it's really going to hit home very very hard and I'm not sure that people are willing to pay for it but let's ask them uh, indeed, but they will not want uh, to hold that referendum. Our government will not want to do it because what they want to do, these world leaders, is persuade themselves that their obsession 
uh, with climate change, uh, with our green future, is wildly popular among the people. Uh, and the reason they won't have that referendum is because secretly they fear that the British public would vote against Boris's green fantasy because it'll cost us too much money. Uh, so they are forging ahead uh, with something that nobody voted for uh, and uh, they are, they've become a power unto themselves and we, the people, do not even get a look in. It's kind of strange, is it not? It is incredibly strange. I think they're also, it's just so ironic. They don't see that the, the sort of the, the enormous travesty in this. The fact is that government ministers talk about hydrogen boilers. That technology doesn't exist. They talk <laughs> about ground source heat pumps. That technology isn't very good. They're talking about actually freezing your gram with their boiler ban. None of it is workable. None of it is practical. And people can't afford it. And it just seems incredibly hypocritical that you've got these, these elected leaders who are essentially pontificating and, and traveling around the world on their jets telling us uh, mere common mortals what we can and can't do and that's why i feel really strongly that we need to ask the british people because when it comes down to it although 70 percent want change and want to see something done about it only seven percent think that they should actually pay for it and i don't think people have the means and the resources to pay for it remember a million small businesses have been in serious trouble over the last two years because of covid they didn't get any help the businesses collapsed and people are really struggling Food prices going up, energy prices going up. And the last thing people want to pay for is a new boiler. It's like I said earlier, David, you know, the, this lot, these world leaders, these pampered world leaders polishing their own halo, they think they're b banging a really popular drum. I've got bad news for, the, for them. They're not. Uh, but uh, they uh, seem to be so unself-aware, or is it self-unaware, <laughs> Uh, that, uh, that what their antics up in Glasgow, arriving by private jet, uh, booking into five-star hotels, saving the planet one banquet and one champagne reception at a time. It is this breathtaking display of hypocrisy uh, that means that COP26 will, uh, in terms of popularity with the people, not only achieve nothing, it will score an own goal. I think people are revolted by what they're seeing here. So, yeah, so do I. And it was interesting. During um, Boris Johnson's questions, I watched the feed and I watched the comments that were coming in and none of them were very pleasant. I think people feel that they are totally out of touch, that it's they weren't elected on this mandate. And if they are that keen that they think this is a vote winner, put it to the test and call a general election. Uh, as I say, they won't do that because uh, <laughs> no, they're, they scared, they're scared of what the people really think. You know, they, they base their uh, the political platform, their green platform, on the fact that surveys and polls are conducted all the time. And when you go around asking people, uh, would you uh, like to save the planet? Or would you like to see the planet destroyed? They, they tend to answer the former. We'd like to save the planet. And for on this basis, Boris said, it's wildly popular. Well, it isn't if it's going to cost us a fortune. We're already paying £150 a year more on our energy bills uh, and our taxes. Uh, taxes are going to go up and up and up to pay for uh, mm. Boris's green floating windmills and his uh, green fantasy generally. And the more it costs us, uh, the less popular this is going to be. But, but we also need to look at this in context because actually the UK do has done a very good job. But also we need to look at this globally. You've got country, we're all at very different stages of development. India, a country I've been to many, many times, has huge disparity of rich and poor. People struggling really on the breadline. They have no money at all. And that really climate change is the least of their problems. So we've got to look at this in terms of the global mix, but also in terms of just going forward. We have no coherent energy strategy. I have no idea what the government is planning in terms of making sure that we not only have secure energy, but we own our own energy. We're not held ransom by the likes of Russia and China. And none of that has been worked out. This is all fanciful nonsense. And I think it needs to stop. It really is fanciful nonsense. And of course, we could get ourselves a nice cheap supply of energy if we uh, returned to shale gas uh, drilling. Uh, but of course, we won't do that because the eco nuts persuaded us not to. There's a lot of uh, cheap gas available to us, but we're not allowed to drill for it.
Well, I think as a short term uh, sort of uh, benefit, then there is an argument to have shale gas, but you need to develop longer term strategies. Now, wind is part of that. Solar is part of that. But so is nuclear power. Where are the plans for the SMRs that we need to be building? Why haven't we actually moved ahead with that national infrastructure plan? We haven't done it. Why are we actually allowing foreign companies to build nuclear power stations? They should be UK owned, owned by the UK taxpayer and by UK pension funds, because the as we've already seen with France and the way that they've been trying to treat Jersey and threatening to cut off their power, until we have energy security and we are confident we can create our own energy and we are in control of it, we're not going to get any further. Agreed. Uh, let's uh, leave uh, the world leaders to polish their halos up in Glasgow and uh, perhaps return to the real world. You and I were discussing vaccine passports last week, David, because you went to a concert uh, <laughs> where you were required to produce evidence that you'd had double jab. You did that. And guess what? You got COVID. Glad to see that uh, you seem to be back to your fighting fit best now. Uh, so that's good news. But uh, you were very disdainful about the efficacy of vaccine passports, which brings me to Wales. Wales has got vaccine passports. They've been in operation for a few weeks now. Uh, it's got the highest COVID rates in the country. Uh, why uh, uh, is England still interested in vaccine passports when we have that evidence, your personal evidence and Wales's evidence that it just they just don't work. <laughs> Well, I know, absolutely. I mean, the whole thing is absolutely ridiculous. If you look at the hard f science, and remember, the government keeps saying we're going to be led by the science and then, quite frankly, ignores it. 80% um, of people are now vaccinated. We believe 92% have antibodies against COVID. Even the doom mongers of SAGE are saying that actually it's not going to be as bad this winter as it has been previously. And we've broken that link between getting COVID, as I did, and becoming seriously ill and being hospitalised or dying and all of that is really good. But the elephant in the room, once again, is what's happening to everyone else. The six million waiting for elective procedures, those thousands of people who can't start chemotherapy or radiotherapy. And the thing that's really incensed me is the fact that actually the public behaved incredibly well in that lockdown and didn't go and see their GPs. They're desperate to see GPs. As we know, you can't see a GP. Many of them still not doing face-to-face -face appointments, even though the government has told them to do so. And now the British Medical Association, the union that represents me, is threatening strike action. Again, I think this shows they are totally out of touch with how people are feeling. The fact is that we pay for the NHS, we've protected the NHS, and it's now time for the NHS to protect us. Yes, as uh, as I said uh, previously, uh, in, in exactly what way does the BMA think that GPs threatening to go on strike protects the NHS. <laughs> it's just uh, breathtaking, that nonsense. Well, also, uh, I just think it shows how out of touch they are, actually. The average GP does three days of clinical work a week. They spend about 59% of time seeing patients. The average salary for a GP is extremely good. It's 100000 before expenses and before tax. And when you contrast that with those people who've lost their businesses, people who are struggling, people on minimum wage, suddenly it seems incredibly greedy and out of touch for the GPs to to say they want more money, they want better conditions. It's not acceptable. Yeah, particularly at this moment, uh, while we still are fighting the COVID crisis. Although, as you indicate, David, it does seem to be uh, uh, rescinding a little bit, going into retreat a bit. So hopefully we will not have a winter of discontent in terms of COVID, although I'm sure the hospitals will get overrun like they usually do every year. It's a grand old winter tradition. Uh, my final question, really, to bring us back to where we started. Why do you think it is that the uh, COP26 delegates in Glasgow and Scotland uh, don't have to follow uh, the vaccine passport <laughs> rules like the rest of the population? Well, isn't that a good question? How is it members of parliament don't have to follow their own rules with mask wearing? I mean, all of the rest of it, you know, there, there's one rule for, for them and one rule for us. And that just simply isn't right. I was always taught you lead by example. They're not doing that. They're certainly not. Uh, David, uh, excellent to talk to you as always. Thank you so much.